Welcome inside episode 592 of the Locked On Senators podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Piller, up in the Blue Mountains. Ross Levitan still away on vacation, but he will be joining me in our interview with EP's David St. Louis. Definitely stick around for that interview as he talks about Frank Nazar, Brad Lambert, what are some options for the Sens at 7th overall. So it's a great chat we have with him getting into prospects for the 2022 NHL draft. Kevin Fiala has been traded. Not to the Ottawa Senators. A very disappointing news for Sens fans. I'll get into what that trade was all about and if it would have made sense for the Ottawa Senators. And finally, the draft is very close. So some of our prospect experts are making their final mock drafts and there are some interesting changes to how they see things shaking up. Get ready for the Locked On Senators podcast. Here we go. Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today is Thursday, June 30th. Thank you for making the Locked On Senators podcast your first listen or watch of the day. We're free and available wherever you get your audio podcasts and on YouTube. So if you want to support the show, give us a like, quick thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment below. Today's juiciest topic is the target all Sense fans were hoping for. Kevin Fiala just had a massive year for the Winnip- or, uh, Minnesota Wild, sorry. And uh, it looks like he has been moved to the Los Angeles Kings. I'm going to be honest. I didn't even have them on my radar. Like, I really thought it was between the Ottawa Senators and the New Jersey Devils when Elliot Friedman reported yesterday things are intensifying. I thought it was going to be one of those two teams, and L.A. swooped in, and it makes a lot of sense for them as uh, they've got some great depth uh, in the center position. You look at Kopitar, Deneau, um, Quentin Byfield is coming up through the ranks, and then they need some help scoring. They acquired Victor Arvidsson last year. Now they add Kevin Fiala to that mix, and you've got some scoring wingers that can help out that young group. Now, here's where it gets interesting. All the trade proposals for Kevin Fiala, they included, they started for the Sens with the seventh overall pick. So a lot of value there. And then they included usually a guy like Ridley Gregg, JBD, Lassie Thompson, something like that, a good prospect. And then even more. So the fact that the LA Kings were able to acquire Kevin Fiala for a first round pick, which I believe is a 19th overall, and Brock Faber, a second round selection defenseman from a couple drafts ago, is pretty impressive. And now I'm not trying to knock Brock Faber. He's a great prospect. And uh, that's someone I'm sure that uh, LA did not want to give up as I would say defense is a big part of uh, one of their glaring issues, especially at the NHL level. So giving up a top level prospect on defense was a big ask for them, but you get Kevin Fiala in return. So it was an interesting uh, price. I think the Senators, if you put the seventh overall pick and a guy like JBD or Lassie Thompson, so someone similar, I would even say ahead of Brock Faber into that trade, you should end up getting that uh, the same value, if not more, heading towards Minnesota. But when you look at the contract extension that Fiala signed, so he signs a seven-year extension worth $7.875 million uh, AAV. That's right around where I expected Kevin Fiala's salary to be. I'll I'll be honest, that's even a little bit lower. I thought it'd be eight million or more because he just put up eighty-five points. He had over thirty goals, and he's only twenty-five. So you're getting this guy in his prime. They're the LA Kings are now getting Kevin Fiala for seven years, and a lot of that is going to be his prime. And he's going to be playing with a good centerman in the Los Angeles. So for the Kings, it's a great deal for Fiala. I'm sure he's stoked about it. You, you got to think it was the age old narrative where it's just he had other options and he decided that they were more enticing than Ottawa at the, at the end of the day, I guess. I'm not sure how it all shook out here. Maybe he didn't want to sign the extension. Maybe they had a deal in place and he, he wanted to go somewhere else. But he was an RFA, so he didn't have a whole lot of uh, as much leverage as he would if he was going into UFA. So it's very interesting how this shook out. 
I'm disappointed. I already had uh, Laleem's, our boy Laleem's Martian already put up a mock pick of uh, Kevin Fiala wearing a Sens jersey going through the, the line as if he just scored a goal on the ice. And I had that picture in my head already, him beside Tim Stutzla and Drake Batherson. It seemed amazing. But we know now that that is not the case. So time to move on to other targets. Leave a comment below who your next top target would be, as I think consensus, all Sens fans, Kevin Fiala was the guy we were all looking at. And then, okay, if that doesn't work out, then we'll move on. So there's options like Clayton Keller from Arizona would make a lot of sense. See, what I like about Clayton Keller is the fact that he's already locked up. So the Sens wouldn't have to play this game of, are you willing to sign an extension? A, and can we keep you at a number that we're comfortable with in uh, option B? So, Clayton Keller would already be locked up. I think he's right around, it's like 7.2 for a good stretch of time. And then if that doesn't work out, again, you could look at Arizona, Nick Schmaltz, a guy that Sens fans got to see a lot of in our two-game span up against the Coyotes as he put up big points in their barn burner games. So that would kind of be your consolation prize. Some people throwing around Chikrin. I feel like that would make a lot of sense, but that's a very short-term thing as uh, I think he only has two years left on his deal at a great price under $5 million, but then age-old sense problem. Now you got to re-sign him. How are you going to keep him around? So I would probably look more at guys like Schmaltz, Keller. Debrinkat is uh, obviously very interesting, but he's going to be getting big money, a 40-plus goal scorer. Like if the Fiala contract scared off the sense. I don't think we should even be thinking about uh, Alex Dabrinkit coming to Ottawa here as uh, he's going to be getting north of $9 million in his next deal. I believe his qualifying offer rate has to start at $9 million. So that's probably not going to happen either. So it's very interesting times for the Ottawa Senators as um, they do not get Kevin Fiala. Disappointing for sure. Pierre Dorian, now it's it's on to the next part of his list, and it's going to be very interesting to see where he goes. If I was a betting man, I would hope that he would uh, sign some RFAs, deal with some in-house contracts at first. And if you are looking to make any sports gambling bets, you got to go to the trusted sports betting book of the Locked On Podcast Network. That's betonline.net. It's the best spot for all your latest odds, Totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land. BetOnline.net is your number one spot for all your sports betting needs. It's the best spot for all your scores, podcasts, news, updates, anything you need, they got it. And it's not just hockey, guys. Basketball is over. Sure, we know that. But baseball is going strong. You got boxing. You got UFC. You got golf. There's other things you can get in on some action on. And the way to start that is betonline.net. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Guys, it's betonline.net where the game starts. And now let's get to our interview with uh, EP's David St. Louis. This is his first time coming on the show. We have been asking him for quite a while. We love, love all the stuff he does with EP especially. And I know if you guys have been watching the prospect uh, profiles we've been doing, all 64 of them, not a big deal. Uh, I, I personally mention David St. Louis a lot as I use his Let's Watch videos on YouTube as a great reference. He does about maybe six to 10 minutes on a, on a prospect going through a couple of their games and looking at all their shifts, what they do well defensively, what they do offensively. It's just nice. It's a little bit different than just your classic highlight video where it's a guy just scoring goals uh, or getting nice assists. So you get to little bit, uh, see a little bit more of what they're doing away from the puck and how they work in transition and stuff like that, which is very important for prospect profiles. So definitely check those out on YouTube. But for now, here's our interview with EPs. David, St. Louis. All right, we now welcome on a very special guest, a man who we've been persistent with trying to get on the show because we appreciate his coverage on prospects so much. You can find his work on Elite Prospects and the coaches site as well. You can follow him on Twitter at David St. underscore Louis. Of course, it's David St. Louis. Welcome to Locked On Senators. How are you doing today, David? I'm great, you. Oh, we're doing fantastic. The draft is just inching ever so close. You must be excited. It's going to be in Montreal. Are you going to be, are you going to be boots on the ground? 
Yeah, and I should be. I haven't received any con confirmation of that, but I should be. It, it's in the works. So I'm really excited about that. It's been a while. It was supposed to be in Montreal last year, I think, and I couldn't And go. 2020 as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's been yeah. two years. So yeah, finally, I get to go, and I think it's going to be really awesome. So what's your sense around this draft compared to, let, let's keep it to last year's draft and 2020, compared to those two, how different is this year's uh, draft class? I think there's more uncertainty at the top of the draft and even later on, on the board. We, uh, in 2020 and 2021, there were more elite prospects maybe at the top of the draft. This is more of an average draft for me, but there's still some really nice talent uh, to get even in the top 10 and the top 15 and later in the draft. It's just that with the OHL players missing a year and some players not developing like we expected, uh, we aren't sure about some of our projections, but there could be some really nice surprise later in the draft that we don't see coming. And the top players in the draft, uh, I think some of them have really separated themselves from the pack and there are some really nice players to get still. So we just had a couple people on who went a different direction at number one. But yourself, are you still having Shane Wright at the top of the class? Yeah, it was harder for me to project Shane Wright there at the beginning of the year and the middle part of the year. I wasn't sure about him. And I had a lot of debates with my colleagues at Elite Prospects about it. But then um, at the end of the year, even if though Savkowski made a better case for himself i think we came to consensus uh, for for us shane wright has the most upside in the draft and he also has the most certainty so i think when you picture shane wright you get a really safe prospect you know yeah. what he's going to be like at least a middle six center and probably something better and his upside is just as great as some of the other uh, other players like logan cooley and slavkowski so why not just use your first pick on him and be sure what you get? And you also have the same upside to go along with it. So for us, at the end, it was pretty clear. Shane Wright all the way. And the, the Habs have been looking for that type of centerman for, yes. for years, right? Yeah. So it just seems like why not, you know, when they have them there, you can't get them in trades as easier. So just, you know, take the safe pick. That's fair. But with the Senators, we're kind of hoping that they go a little more risky. We just profiled Frank Nazar. I think he'd be an awesome yeah. fit. Like yeah. what makes him so fun? Because you guys at elite prospects are a little higher on him than the consensus. Yeah. We had him as high as fourth, I think maybe even third overall at some point. Um, we really, really like him. We had a debate between him and Logan Cooley all year for us. It's really neck and neck. We have Logan Cooley ahead right now, just slightly, but really we could have Frank Nazar and make the same arguments for Frank Nazar. He's a different player than Logan Cooley. He's really inside driven. So his game is, uh, even though he's five foot nine, he's really physical and he, he um, gets in front of opponents in the slot to get his stick on rebounds. He works the boards. He's really good at protecting the puck and he's really good at getting the puck out of scrums. So if a puck is sitting on the wall, he's going to battle for it. And he has really great technique to seal it from the opponent and then get his stick on it and move it to an open teammate. So he keeps a really high awareness of, of his, of his support and his teammates, even under intense pressure. And these are very NHL, NHL, NHL translatable skills. So I think he's going to have an easier time even tra translating his game than Logan Cooley to the NHL. And he's also very dynamic. His skating ranks a bit higher than us, uh, a, bit, a bit higher than Logan Cooley. Um, it, it received a slightly higher grade from our staff. And he's really dynamic. He has playmaking skills. He can manipulate defenders. And he does it really fast, too. And that's that's what we like about him, the pace of in this game. So he doesn't slow down to make his moves. Like, it, he goes all in super fast. And he can manipulate at that speed, make fakes, and find a teammate or shoot on that. He wasn't always consistent during the season. And at the end of it, he was injured. So we didn't get to see him at his full force. But he really pr pr progressed. So at the beginning of the year, in September, we saw him more as a solo uh, creator so he would try and dangle every defender yep. but by the end of the, the season he really progressed in that he, he was using his teammates all the time he became a much more efficient playmaker so we like the progress we like the pace and we like the physical skills yeah and uh, you guys gave out a lot of awards for Frank Nazar um, you gave him <laughs> highest ceiling which is, is one I definitely want to take a look at highest transition forward second straight line skating second best vision second best problem solving my question to you is do you see him projecting more as a centerman in the pros or more as a winger because Sens fans, the last couple drafts, we've been looking at guys that we, we wanted a centerman, but a lot of prospect analysts were like, yeah, he probably projects more as a winger. 
now I feel like it's kind of the flip for Sens fans. We're like, okay, we really want a winger now, but this guy has been playing center. Could he play the wing? For me, it's like 60, 40, 60 wing for, for the okay. center. I, I'm, I'm thinking he's going to be more of a wing than a center, but some people inside early prospects would disagree with me. They would really see him as a center. Um, I like it. It is board game a lot. And when you're that good on the boards, even if you're five foot nine, you can play a really effective wing game on breakouts. So on the walls, you can hold on to pinching defenders on your back and move pucks quickly to your teammates accelerating the middle of the ice. He's a, he's a great puck distributor now. So and he, his defensive game has improved too. So he could play center, but he's just as, as effective wherever you place him on the ice. So I wouldn't discard him because of his position right now. So why don't we just stick with the U.S. program? Because it seems like a strong year. We did a top 64. It feels like every other day we're talking about someone from the program. And naturally, one of the fits for, for Ottawa fans, they, they've been really high on Cutter Gote. It seems like one of the high risers that might not even be available when, when seventh overall comes, yeah. the way that he's moving up. Almost seems like Jake Sanderson that year, where it was like, is he a, a teens? Is he 10? And then he goes fifth overall. What what kind of game would Cutter Gauthier translate to the NHL? And is he a little more NHL ready due to his bigger frame, or is he still a guy you'd have to be patient with in developing? That's a really great question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> for, for, for Gauthier, I don't know if he's NHL ready. I think NHL teams get a bit overexcited about him right now. I, I really like him, and we have him pretty high. But he's not in his final form yet. So he's a big guy who... Um, well, he's more of a shooter and connective game at this point. So he's better in open eyes, making quick uh, short passes to teammates and firing off their passes. So he played a lot with Logan Cooley uh, this season. And Logan Cooley likes to have the puck all the time. <laughs> that's, that's really his game. So Gauthier had to play more of a supporting style. And I don't think he developed his playmaking and his board game as much as he will in the next few years. So maybe give him a bit more time. But the, the, the final product, product with him should be uh, a guy who's really great on the boards too and who can play that kind of supporting game and short not short playmaking but quick playmaking game so he's not the one to really hold on the puck and, and manipulate defenders and create lanes he more he, he gets the puck and moves it quickly to a, to a teammate but i think he's going to get even better on retrieval so finding pucks on the boards moving them to, to teammates and attacking the slot, playing more, using his, his size, really. I saw him protect Fox this season, but he doesn't have the as great of a technique as Frank Nazar, for example, who's a much smaller player, but who can better use his limbs and his back to really slip in front of defenders and move Fox out. Gauthier will learn to do that, I'm sure, because he's a really engaged player. Right now, he still has to add some technique to his game and develop his playmaking and even work on his mobility even more. He's a pretty good skater, but he has potential for more. So patience, but yes, in terms of certainty of his projection, he's uh, he's a pretty certain player. You know what you're going to get, like a second line winger or center, depending on what you want. Uh, and if, if that doesn't work out, you can always play in the bottom of your lineup. So the NHL teams really like that. Yeah, those are two players we're both very high on for the Sens to pick at seventh overall. If if you had um, any other options, because like we talked about, it's quite possible uh, Nazar and Gauthier, one of them, or maybe even both, are gone before the Sens uh, draft at seventh overall. Who else would you would you think could be a good fit for the Sens there? There are many. They really have to do yeah. a ton of work at seventh overall because they probably like someone already, but there are a ton of candidates. So we uh, we really like Joachim Kemal, who's yeah. a, a great shooter who can really position away from the puck. So his game is anticipating the flow of the play and supporting it at the right time. So attacking pockets of space to get the puck and fire off of them. There's Jonathan Lekirimaki, who is pretty good at that too. I prefer the Camel. Uh, Camel, sorry. I have some doubts about like Kiribaki's hockey sense and physical skills, yeah. but he really exploded toward the end of the year. And that U18, he showed much better playmaking. He started using his shot as a playmaking tool. So he would fake a shot, get an opponent to, into a blocking position and feed the puck to a teammate. And that I didn't really see uh, him capable of doing that in, in the first part of the year. So he's adding to his game and he's improving and he's probably a bit further in his uh, physical development and then a bit more back. He's not as mature physically as Joachim Kemal. I think he's going right. to add more to his game. They are, there's Marco Casper, who oh. I think is it's a, it's a pick that is, the Sens probably like. And it's a bit of a dirty guy. He's really fast, a four checker, constant pressure all over the ice, and he showed much better playmaking at the World Championship. So he's, he constantly adds to his game too. 
and he plays that engage and fast-paced type of game that NHL teams really like. Yep. And there are a bunch of defensemen too. Seventh overall is a bit high for some of them. I think uh, if I if I think back to what NHL scouts told me, but we have uh, Pavel Mentukov, uh, yep. who's a playmaker from the point, who there's uh, Denton Mematechak, who plays like Roman Giosi in the WHL. So he's all over the ice all the time. And that's really fun, but he... I don't think he's going to get picked at seventh overall, but we really like him. Yeah. And there's Kevin Korczynski too, who yep. can dangle opponents one-on-one, who can uh, break out the puck really, really, really well, but he has some defensive issues. So there are a ton of possibilities here. It's really mm-hmm. up to the sense what they want, what type of profiles they want, and what type of, what type of upside and certainty they want too. Yeah, I'll just take Kevin Fiala for it instead. But no, if they do pick, mm-hmm. there, there are going to be some decisions to make and with the Senators, it's such an interesting time right now because they have a lot of prospects, but so many have graduated that it's not maybe as strong of a pool top to bottom that you'd expect. And of course, they've gone off the board a few times, which is still kind of hit or miss of what's going to happen when it comes to all that. Now, I want to focus on a few players that you wrote articles about. And one in particular, we're talking about defensemen. Please tell me this guy's not going seventh overall, but I could see the Senators being interested in the profile of Maverick Lamoureux later on in the draft. Now, what would he bring to an NHL team? Because if, if I'm not mistaken, it was you that said you liked him better when he was 6'3 than now when he's six foot seven. Yeah, it's been hard for him. Imagine growing like five inches, I think, in a summer again. So you have to relearn everything yeah. uh, on the ice. It's really hard for him. This season, we still saw his ability to play with the puck and manipulate defenders. And he's a pretty smooth handler, but... At times, the puck would just get away from him. He would miss a handle and he just miss the puck and it create, would create dangerous turnovers. So he's not there yet. He's much, uh, he has much more to learn than other prospects in his draft. He's, uh, his, his development is he's going to need some time for sure. But he's now six foot seven. He plays a really physical game and he's a pretty smooth skater. We gave him a five grade when our, we use a one to nine scale. Five is NHL average. So we, we, we project that in a few years, he's going to be able to catch up to players in the NHL and just shadow attackers in his zone too. He's, he's, he won't have any trouble with his skating, his mobility. And if, you, if you're an average skater and you're six foot seven, you have a lot of defensive range. You can affect a lot of every year on the ice. So NHL teams will love that, but there are some issues about his decision-making too, his ability to read plays at time. Um, is that a consequence of not having the skill to hit those plays? And so he's a bit awkward right now. It's just a lot more uncertainty with him. But I really like him as a, as a prospect, as a person. And I, he really works at, at his game too. So he's a project that ne- he needs a strong development team around him. But he could be a really, really nice addition in the second round somewhere. There's a uh, fantastic article that you wrote at eprinkside.com. Everyone can go check that out. And I love, there's lots of great clips in it. So I'm not ruining it by saying this one line, but I absolutely love when, when you say, when ranking Lamoureux, one has to be careful to weigh his lower certainty against his higher upside. So as you mentioned, kind of a guy where in the right yeah. system, all of a sudden you're looking at, at a, a unicorn. There's not a whole lot of six foot seven defense, but if we were to say that he projected kind of like a Logan Stanley, would that be a fair shades of not player comparable though? Yeah, I can see it. There are some similarities in their game, uh, the physicality, and I think Logan Stanley also has those playmaking moments at, at times. So, yeah, it's a pretty with fair. The I deci- think he's a bit... <laughs> with the decision-making, too, on the other yeah. end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a problem, maybe. But you can work on that. I think he processes the game pretty fast still. So when a player can read the eyes and he just makes wrong decisions, it's less worrying for me because you can – he has uh, – a way to work on his decision making because he, he can process all of that. So I, I'm pretty optimistic with him, but we still have more or on, on our board because of what you said, because of the certainty that's not as high. I want to talk about uh, a guy that is a big boom or bust type of guy. And um, I, I'm fascinated with where he's going to go in the draft. And that's Brad Lambert. I mean, if you, if you ask people a year ago, he's going top three, maybe even first overall. And guys were very excited to see how he was going to progress in this season. But from all reports, it seems like he has not progressed, maybe even degressed a little bit. And what's your uh, opinion of where he's at? And do you think that's something that if the Senators are looking at seventh overall and saying, hey, we, we reached a bit on, uh, on our pick last year, 
let's just try to take a home run swing this year to try to make up for that. Would Brad, Brad Lambert be a guy that makes sense there? It would be a risk. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Just put it like this. He, <laughs> high risk, really, but is there high reward on the oh, other yeah. side of that rainbow? Yeah, Brad Lambert is the most skilled pro prospect in this draft. It's really wow. no, no, no contest. In terms of handling and skating, skating is elite, like really elite things. In, in a few years, it should be one of the better in the NHL if, if he plays in the NHL. Um, and because he's so such a stable and elusive and agile and speedy skater, his handling skills really shine too because he's always in the right position. So it's super easy for him to handle the puck and move it around defenders. Uh, he plays a really a rushing game, kind of Matthew Bar Barzal is really great at challenging defenders one on one of the rush, create a speed difference and fake them one way, go the other way. And he just beats people constantly like this. Um, it's just that there are multiple factors that affected him this season. The main one, I think, was his environment. Um, he didn't get a lot of support. And, Brad Lambert plays a style of game that's really his own. So yeah, he needs the puck all the time and he needs teammates who can fly with him uh, in the offensive zone and really complement his plays. And he didn't really have that this season in the in the Liga, in the, both teams he played in. The issue is that if you're a top prospect, you're supposed to be adaptable. You're supposed to be able to find other ways to create than just your own that you've learned through the years. So Brad Lambert came in through the minor wrench minor ranks being much faster and much better handler than everyone. So he could just run up the ice and score. And the issue with players like that, that are so much more skilled than their peers at lower levels is that they learn a ton of bad habits and they really focus on this style of game because that's what brings them success. And now that he is in Liga and playing against better opponents, he has to figure out other ways and he's not showing adaptability. So that's an issue for us. And he didn't really score that much either. So you can't use his production as another favorable argument uh, in it for him. So yeah, there are some really big pluses and some really big minuses with him too. I don't think he should slide too much at the draft though. It would be ridiculous for me to see him fall all the way to the second round. The upside is just way too massive. Like if you can teach him, um, he got better at the defensive game as the season went on. So he really made efforts in that facet of the game. But if you can place him in the right environment, uh, teach him how to... Uh, expand his rushing game, how to use his teammates even in more productive way. You could really, really look at um, first liner, who someone who carries your offense for years, especially in between blue lines, and who can really create from the half wall on the power play. So high upside, low certainty. <laughs> and, and there, you had a quote on him that I want to highlight here because when we um, profiled him, we used this quote, and I think it's just perfect. Your quote was. Lambert abuses his skills to the utmost degree. And I, I fully understand that because watching him, he's just like, you don't need to be doing all those fancy moves over and over when you're already in the ozone and there's nowhere else to go. Like he was just, you can see the skill there, but sometimes he just needs to dial it back and simplify it and just play smart hockey, which he just tries to tap into that skill level all the time. And he ends up running out of space. Hey, Ross? Yeah, not only that, but my question to you, David, is is he a guy where a team is going to try to get him out of that environment right away where you draft him and then put him in the AHL for a couple of years? Is that the best method? I think he should play junior. Like, he okay. was drafted somewhere in the WHL. It would right. be the best environment for, for, for him right. because it would allow him to use his skills and have success with them, but right. also expand uh, the way he has to use them because the ice is smaller and the, 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 the WHRs are pretty good defenders still, so they would... Uh, pose a threat for him sure. he, he wouldn't be able to go all the way down the ice but he would he would have a high success rate with his moves but he would also need to learn some new ways to create and he would have the support like the, the players in the WHL play a similar style of game uh, a more similar style of game than players in Liga did so I think it would be benefit in multiple ways for him the AHL I think he would face a wall like he wouldn't yeah. be able to create and it would affect his confidence in Liga he doesn't feel comfortable so I don't know what, what the future awaits for him. Uh, well, the, the, the Saskatoon, the Blades have his rights, and that's where his uncle, Ooh. now head coach of the New York Islanders, played, and his dad played uh, for the Blades as well. So, yeah, that makes sense. Good spot Maybe. for him. Maybe. Interesting. No, uh, so who's another boomer bust? Who's a guy who you may, might be really high on or, or lower on than most, but you could see him as being an elite talent down the road? Um, there are a ton of them <laughs> in this draft. Uh, Jager Furtus, another WHLer, who yep. is really small. I think he weighs like 100 and 
49 pounds or something. Very exciting though. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, he definitely is. And he, he shoots, his shot is one of the best in the draft or the best in the draft. And he weights that much. So imagine when he adds to his frame and he even works on his footwork even more. Like he's so good at leveraging his smaller weight to flex his stick and fire the puck on that. Like he, he's really, he has some cold coffee elements, I, I would say. And he's, he's good at reading the play too, to position himself to use that shot. And he's a pretty good playmaker. So he has pretty much every offensive facet you want, except along the boards and in front of the net, which is pretty logical with his frame right now. Really boom up or bust. And there are uh, other ones like uh, Noah Oslon. I think he's going to fall in the draft despite his skill. He's another rusher who plays kind of a game like Brad Lambert, but he's better in support. So he's better at supporting teammates. He's a better playmaker in the offensive zone, but he really plays along the periphery. So he has to learn to get inside and create from inside. So that means cutting in front of defenders, getting stick on the puck, but also uh, learning to not only create from the outside in, but the inside out. So really attacking the middle and dropping and taking the puck to his teammates, attacking in other lanes. He has a bit to learn, but his hockey sense is pretty high and he has the speed and the skill too. And there are a bunch of smaller defenders like Matthias Havilid, who's a really great shooter at the point and a puck mover. And even Russian players like Vladimir Grudin, Grudin, Grudin <laughs> a smaller defenseman who's really, I think he might be the best skater in the draft for a defenseman. He's super agile and allows him to close his gap really fast in the neutral zone and to carry the puck too. So there are a bunch of really interesting players, even later in the draft. Now, the, the Sens pick at uh, pick number 39. That's their first uh, second round selection. Who are some guys that you think might be, I mean, it's possible to really uh, foresee that, but who are some guys that you think might be in that range that would make sense for the Sens to select? Yeah, it depends on what they want. I think they need like right shot defensemen. And yep. start it and Con, right, right, right now, we're the, the, all the talk is it feels like Lassie Thompson or Jacob Bernard Docker at one point will, will be at the NHL level. But again, those guys are 2018, 2019 draft picks. So yeah, right shot D, I'd say, is, is a good place to start. Um, I don't have any right. <laughs> what about um, Ryan Chesley is a name that I really like through the process. Yeah. We spoke about him and Pilsy loves Ty Nelson. I think he's going very, very high in, in the draft. Ryan Chesley, like yeah. top 15, yeah. even top 10. I could see wow. it from some teams. Seventh yeah. overall, U.S. program. Sens love it. There, there are two wild cards, I, th I think, at seventh overall. I don't know if the Sens would do it, but Rodger McGroarty, uh, it was... Uh, I tweeted yeah. out during the under-18s. I said, I am i don't nothing about this draft, but the Senators are going to take Rodger McGroarty. <laughs> I can really see it because he has everything besides skating. And... He works so hard on the ice that the skating might not matter too much. It's going to cool. say beetle average, beetle angel average for sure. Right. Like he has too many me mechanical problems, but he works so hard that it might not matter. And he has the his playmaking skills is just as good as Cooley's at times. And he has the physical skills of Frank Nazar. So everything is there. It's just the skating is pretty scary. He's a Brian wing, Chesley. right? Yeah, yeah, he's a winger. Wing? Uh, I think he can play center, but I see him as a winger just Perfect. because of the skating. Yeah. Too. Makes sense. And Ryan Chesley is like Jake Sanderson light. Uh, he doesn't have the same hockey sense, really, but he projects as a more of a shutdown defenseman. Yep. He has the, the playmaking and the playmaking ability and the puck moving ability, but he needs more space to really get it going. Like the reads aren't quick right now. And I don't understand why, because he has some really great flashes this season, but he was better offensively last year than he was this year. So there was a kind of a, a regress there. But in terms of skating ability, in terms of uh, physicality, sh shutting down opponents, and uh, he has pretty much every other skill you want from a defenseman. So I could see it. It's just the hockey sense. Uh, it brings a bit of uncert uncertainty to his profile too. And for the 39th pick, uh, there are a bunch of defensemen that are really interesting. Uh, Sam Rinzel, he, who's a... And he might be gone before that, but he's a six foot four or five defenseman who's really, really mobile. He played in the high school system. Yeah. See, uh, see David, the last was... time the last time the Sens drafted at a high school was a guy named Brian Lee. So I, I think we might have to stay away from Ooh. the high school kids. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it. He's not, has a lot of risk. So he's a true boomer, boomer and boss prospect because the the reads aren't there. And when he played in the USHL, it was uh, not up to the level of the league at all. And there were efforts concerned too with him, but he has some insane flashes too. And he's six foot four and a clear above average skater. And when I say above average, I always mean that in a few years, the right. projection is going to be above average. Um, there are right shot defensemen. There's Christian Caru, 
it's a bit early for him, I think, for NHL teams at 39 overall, but he's an offensive defenseman who is a really great playmaker. He can manipulate defenders at the point, create shooting lines for himself, create passing plays to teammates. He's a great puck mover too. The defensive game suffers from his um, enthusiasm sometimes. And the skating is not elite. So it's more like a 5, 5.5 on our scale. So average, above average slightly. So I'm not sure it's going to support this type of game, but he has the brain to really become a power play quarterback. And there are a bunch of forwards too, like Philip Meshar, who's another yep. great rusher. He's really small, doesn't have an inside game at the moment, but he's one of the better players in the draft at timing himself inside pockets of space. So he avoids contact, but he does it smartly. He, as the puck comes, he's right there to take it at the same time. If there's a shot fired from the point, he's going to <laughs> run in front of that shot and tip it at the right time. Like he's really good at timing himself inside pockets of space to avoid having to battle with defenders. So that's really great. And there's a player that nobody at Elite Prospects likes besides me. It's uh, Viktor Nuchev, who's a Russian, who's really, really, yeah. he's really, really skills. I think he's going pretty high still, despite the, the Russian factor. And we all okay. understand how that could affect it. Yeah. Um, and the yeah, Sens he... haven't taken a player out of Russia since 2005. Their only okay, Russian that's... draft pick <laughs> was Igor Sokolov, and he was playing in Cape Breton. But it's, it's well, we'll see if the winds have changed. But I don't know if this is the year where you're like, no, now we need to get a Russian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make sense. But tell me about him because we haven't heard about him at all in our yeah. in our profiles. Yeah, he's um, he's a really. It reminds me a bit of Logan Cooley in, in oh. some aspects because he's a really inefficient playmaker. And by inefficient, I mean that he creates just as many turnovers as great plays. Like he's pretty much equal. But his skating, even though it's average, the rest of his skills are really really high. Like he can deceive defenders so well and so smooth, and he has some advanced offensive ideas. So. He can hold the puck, look elsewhere, and like wait a few seconds for a teammate to get to get at a far post, and he will hit him with perfect timing. Like he has, he has the hockey sense, but decision making problems, and those aren't mutually exclusive because he just, I think he likes to create, and he gets a bit over enthusiastic about his playmaking ability, but he can clearly read the play. So he's a really high upside pick that has a lot of uncertainty again because of Russian factor and yes. because of his decision making. Yeah. Now, uh, final question for me, David, and uh, thanks for uh, giving us your time here. We've got a lot of uh, great insight from you, and we'll definitely have to have you back on uh, later on in the off season. But I'll just give you an easy, open-ended question: Who is your favorite prospect in this draft? Doesn't great have question, to be. Pilsy. Thank you, thank you. Doesn't have to be the best. This I will I will give you full opportunity to be as biased as you can. You can you can like them as a person off the ice as well. Who is just the one guy that you're rooting for in this draft class? One guy I'm rooting for. I like a lot of prospects in this draft. I would say it's really Frank Nazar. We talked about him at the right. beginning of the draft, but just because we have him so much higher than everyone else <laughs> and nobody seems to see the player that we knew, it just switched him a lot of success to prove us right, but mostly because he has that <laughs> th style of game to uh, play in NHL and have a lot of success. Like we gave him uh, a shades off comparison in our draft guide of Braden Point. Yeah. And I think the style really fits. Like he's not going to be the same type of player. It's very optimistic to project him as Braden Point, but the, the small area skills and the playmaking and the skating, like even the defensive game that I can prove, he really tries to work on his game. And we saw it in interviews. He's really smart about analyzing the play. Like if, we, if you show him a clip, he's going to be really good at breaking it down, understanding what- Maybe he's going to take better. your job making let's watch videos. You yeah, be yeah. He, he would be better than me for sure. So <laughs> <laughs> got to be careful about that. Yeah. But, yeah, I really like him as a person too. Uh, I like his hockey brain off the ice even. And I like that he works at his game so much. So he's my favorite. Awesome. <laughs> awesome, David. We really appreciate you joining us. Merci beaucoup. Now I have one final yes. question. I'm asking every single yes. interview we do. North Dakota, we know it's a pipeline yes. straight to yeah. Ottawa. Dylan James, what's the rundown on him? And when would it be an okay time to take him off the board? I know at Elite Prospects, you guys have him a little lower than we've seen on some different rankings, but what do you think about his game and how it could translate going forward? I don't know Dylan James, James, sorry. So that's, th that's the part of the draft that we're at with Dylan <laughs> <Okay>. James. There <laughs> we go. Well, when it comes to him, we'll, we'll talk when we draft him at 39. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
do you really like him? Who's I, I think James? he's all right. Like uh, he's been as high as I feel like it was Bob McKenzie. Someone had him in like the mid forties, but he's a guy who's going out of USHL one rookie of the year with uh, Sioux city. And then he's going to North Dakota. That's, that's really all that really turned us on to him, but sounds like at his peak, he'd be like kind of like a meat and potatoes, third line guy. Yeah. So, um, the Sens um, love that. I'm, I'm reading his, pro, his profile right now and he, I think he has skating issues and yeah. the, the hockey sense grade wasn't that high for us, okay. but he was really f- physical and he had a great shot on our ranking. So, I mean, that sounds like two, two out of two for, for the sense checklist right yeah. there, <laughs> North Dakota, you can add a third one, David, we can't thank you enough. This has been fantastic. We appreciate it. Everyone's going to be smarter having heard your insight on the draft and we look forward to following along on Twitter at David St. Underscore Louis. And you can obviously follow his work with Elite Prospects and EP Rankside. All right. Thank you, David St. Louis, for joining us. Great chat with him. And uh, he's someone we're definitely going to have back on the show once the Sens uh, draft picks are made. And he can tell us whether he likes them or not, what uh, what he thinks of the overall um draft that the Ottawa Senators have. So definitely going to get David St. Louis back on the show later on as we enjoyed that chat. Hope you did as well. Speaking of the draft, and uh, if you haven't watched our mock draft already, we're approaching 10,000 views on YouTube. Honestly, I knew it was going to do well. You guys were asking for it. So we wanted to do it right, get the best guests, make it a four hour long video. But this is really exceeding my expectations of what we had. So we cannot thank you guys enough for all the support because that was something we were really unsure if that was going to work or not. And clearly it's working. I think we'll probably see that as an annual tradition. So you guys uh, showing some love is going to get you some great content in uh, the upcoming years for the draft, as we always do. Now, speaking of mock drafts, a couple of the entities we use, including Corey Pronman, we just had on the show yesterday, uh, Chris Peters, who was also on the show a couple days ago, and Cam Robinson, who was a part of our mock draft. They all put out their own mock drafts and there are some very interesting changes, to say the least. Let's just go. Um, well, I'll let you know who they had the send selecting, though. So Chris Peters, he has the send selecting Joaquin Kamel at seventh overall. Personally, I'd be pretty stoked about that, and that's kind of the that's kind of the conservative idea of where I have the sense drafting. Like that's like where I'd be like, yep, that makes sense. That's what I was expecting. Joaquin Kamel, not to downplay his play or his value, because I think. We talked about not being able to get Kevin Fiala in a trade. Not that I think Joaquin Kamel can put up 85 points uh, when he's 25 years old. That's pretty exceptional. But I think he can be a great secondary scoring option that could really help out Tim Stutz and Drake Batheson down the road if, if he continues to project the way he is. So I'd be stoked with Kamel personally. Now let's move to uh, Pronman. So Corey Pronman has the Sen selecting Matthew Savoy at seventh overall. Savoy is an interesting one because I, I can get excited about his offensive upside. He has a lot of skill. He put up 90 points with the Winnipeg Ice. He's a smaller guy, so likely he's going to go on the wing, which isn't an issue for the Sens. I could see him playing a decent role with uh, that same spot with uh, Drake Batheson and Joachim, or uh, Tim Stutzla, sorry. So I could see that working. I have some concerns about him, and... If Savoy is the guy they end up going with, that would be one of those things where I'm like, I, I appreciate this pick and I'm going to get behind it. But there's probably guys they left on the board that maybe I would have been more interested in. But as we know, it takes like three three years to really uh, see things shake out and see how we go here. This is the one that gets me very, very excited. Our friend Cam Robinson, also from EP, he did his mock draft. And he has the Sens having the opportunities to select David year check at seventh overall oh my god if that was actually an opportunity if the Sens have the opportunity to draft in in my mind and i would say eps as well it generally a lot of people agree with this opinion david year is the best defenseman in the draft if not one a then he's one b right behind simon nemich if the Sens are able to get a right hand shot defensive defenseman, I would say actually more. He's more of a two-way guy. There's some some offensive upside there. That would be incredible because then you've got someone that you can pin up beside Thomas Shabbat, finally get him a legit D partner. Or with Jake Sanderson, 
if the Sens were able to select David Yerchek, I think that like that's I mentioned Joachim Kamel is like my conservative. Like, all right, that's what's going to happen. But David Yerchek would be all time high. Like, I don't think it can get much better than that, really, apart from getting one of the top uh, top three forwards, which it, there's no way that's going to happen in my mind. So if Yerchek is available, like Cam Robinson thinks it could happen, whoo, that. It would, it would be awesome. I would be very excited about that. So those are some of the mock drafts that uh, happened. I just wanted to go over where uh, these guys had the Sens picking tomorrow. A couple of other things to round out the show, Sens related. There's actually a lot of news uh, happening today. So that's uh, exciting for me to be able to go over this without Ross here. I usually teeing me up. I just got to tee myself up here. So that's nice to have uh, some news here. And hey, Pierre Dorian, he loves winners. He's going to like seeing what Philippe Daoust just won as the St. John Sea Dogs just won the Memorial Cup and Philippe Daoust was a part of that. Incredible story for the Sea Dogs to get bounced very early from the playoffs, have to hang around, wait. I'd love to talk to their head coach or the coaching staff to see how they kept these guys in game shape, not only physically, but mentally as well. Like to stay hungry and to stay ready while all these other teams are battling, working their way to the Mem Cup and you're just waiting for them to come visit uh, in St. John is pretty impressive that they were able to pull through with this. So big stick taps to Philip Daoust and uh, the St. John Sea Dogs for winning the Mem Cup. That's huge. Uh, JBD, Jacob Bernard Docker, he turns 22 years old today. Crazy that he still has a long way to go as he seems like a really good prospect and someone that I still have and talk about your check possibly playing with Shabbat if the Sens end up drafting him. I really see JBD as his eventual partner. Will it happen next season or even the season after that? Maybe not, but I think long term, JBD really projects to be a guy that could play well with Thomas Shabbat. So congrats. I was going to say congrats. Happy birthday to JBD turning 22 today. A couple of other notes. On this day in 1994, the Sens draft Hockey Hall of Famer Daniel Alfredson at all the way down at 133rd overall. The value, talking about value with draft picks. Oh my God, 133rd overall for the greatest franchise player ever for the Ottawa Senators and their first legitimate guy to be uh, inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Damn. Well done on the 1994 draft, Ottawa Senators, that's for sure. And speaking of guys, um, I don't think uh, the 1994 is probably a bit early, but guys that have been around for a while and franchise all-time players. How about the greatest franchise goalie in Sens history? And Craig Anderson, he signs a one-year deal with the Buffalo Sabres, so he's sticking around. It's, uh, it's nice to see him in the same division. He gets to come to Ottawa a couple more times. And that was a good story. Craig Anderson, he wanted to be in Buffalo. He wanted to help uh, shape this franchise and bring it down or uh, up out from the gutters and help these young kids kind of get uh, acclimated to what it's like playing a pro-style game, 82 games a season, and uh, be a good veteran voice in that room. Even though it's kind of rare for the veteran voice to be the goalie, I think Craig Anderson did a really good job of that. And when you hear stories about him in Buffalo, that seems to be the... Uh, what everybody says is they really wanted to keep him around, not just because he's, he's still a solid goalie, but because of his better presence. So love to see Andy keep on going on as uh, we're a goalie friendly show here. And we got a lot of respect for what Craig Anderson does. So that was a packed show for this uh, Thursday. And uh, I had a lot of fun doing this spot on my own. I'm going to do a couple more episodes on my own as Ross is still away. He's going to be heading to on a cruise in Greece. Tough life for Ross there. But uh, definitely excited that we have more interviews coming for you guys. I'll tease, I'll tease one. We got uh, our friend Tony Ferrari, friend of the show. He comes back on as he was a part of that mock draft as well. So if you guys like that, and we've had Tony on the show multiple times, definitely stick around for this for this interview coming up next week. Guys, we're doing something that we don't usually do. Tomorrow, we are taking the day off. This is one of our first regularly scheduled days that we've taken a day off in a long time. Usually, we don't take days off. We do bonus episodes. Like, how about a bonus four-hour video that is not required by Locked On at all? That's just something we decided to toss out there. So, we thought we'd uh, have ourselves a little break. Ross is still away. As you guys know, I'm going to go on a little camping trip, disconnect for a little while. So, we will have no show tomorrow. Enjoy your day. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks for following along with the Locked On Senators podcast. It's your team. 
every day.